Welcome to Scripture and Tradition. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa. This is a program where we talk about sacred scripture and do so in light of the tradition. Now, we would love to have you be part of the show by adding your questions and comments during the live program, which is at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can call in at 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are not in North America, that number will not work. So you can call country code 1, area code 205-271-2968. One. 205-271-2980. Also, you can send us your questions and comments via email by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. Or, if you know how to do all this stuff, you can follow us and par participate with the show on Facebook and on YouTube. Today, we're moving closer to the end of our series on listening to God and discerning His will. The book uh, is still available. It's called How to Listen When God is Speaking, a guide for modern-day Catholics. That's available at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 1833. But in the next couple weeks, we'll be starting a new book and topic that is trying to take these principles we've been discussing and apply them very concretely to the Gospels. This series will be uh, based on a book that we're, uh, I did about the life of Christ. It's actually a couple of books I did where I take various events in the life of Christ and develop some meditations. Our goal will be able to help all of us spend more time on specific events in the life of Christ so that we can get to know Him better. The top priority is that by listening to the Gospels and coming to know Christ in the Gospels, you can improve your relationship with Jesus. You can allow it to grow deeper and develop more. So for that new series, we have uh, one of two books that we'll be using. One of them is going to be called Praying the Gospels, Jesus Launches His Public Ministry. Now this book is available also at Catalog, which is EWTNRC.com. It is item number 52687. Item 52687, Praying the Gospels, Jesus Launches His Mission. I hope that it's a helpful guide. And remember that if you miss some episode of Scripture and Tradition, our shows are available online. You can either go to EWTN.com or our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash EWTN, youtube.com slash EWTN. And you can watch it whenever it's convenient for you and see if that helps you with your prayer over these passages from the gospel. All right, well, let's get back to what we're discussing in um, how to listen we're in the last chapter, and we are dealing with a section about integrating 
a wide variety of elements into our prayer. We talked about how important it is to keep a balance of everything Christ has done. You don't focus on the birth of Christ to the exclusion of the crucifixion. You don't focus on the crucifixion to the exclusion of the resurrection and so on. That's one element. That's a, that is a Catholic approach that you don't say, all I need is this. And it is only this. That's not the way the gospel is. The gospel is so rich. Why would you want to exclude things from the truth of the gospel by saying, I just need this all by itself. I need this alone is enough. No, that's not correct. Okay. So now I'd like to further deal with this because one of the components that we need to integrate is human intellect. Human intellect. This is a very important thing. I was critical last time of some scholars and you know I think that that's uh, sometimes deserved but I'll explain why I think that criticism is deserved by going first to the positive aspect of intellect. That first of all, sacred scripture, the Bible itself attributes great importance to the role of our human intellect. Intellect, the ability to reason and think, is one of the qualities that sets us apart from the other animals. They can be taught a lot of good things and they can learn a lot of cool tricks and they have a lot of wonderful instincts, but they act by instinct, not by reason. We can think through basic principles in a way that uh, never would be the case for any animal. So, uh, as a matter of fact, somebody had once said that if you set a monkey to a, um, a typewriter, he would eventually uh, be able to type out all of Shakespeare. Well, somebody let a monkey try that. And but based on as much as was done by that monkey after quite a number of hours, they figured it would take a few trillion years before the monkey could type out Shakespeare. Um, it's not going to happen. Uh, and then it would be an accident, not something on purpose. So this is a very important element. And the scripture especially puts the role of the human mind in terms of wisdom. Not just knowledge. You can accumulate lots of knowledge, but you also need wisdom, which is the mind's ability to make sense out of a wide variety of experiences. You see how things come together. Now, where does the Bible promote this? Well, very clearly in the wisdom books. There's a whole class of books in the Bible that are oriented towards wisdom. The book of Proverbs is a wisdom book. The book of Ecclesiastes, in Hebrew known as Kohelet. The book of Sirach is another book of great wisdom. Um, some of the wisdom also has a bit of a, a pessimism about it. It's dealing with the shadowy sides of life, as in the book of Job and the book of Ecclesiastes. So Proverbs, Sirach, the wisdom of Solomon, those focus on the positive elements of wisdom. But the negative aspects of life's difficult moments are also found in the wisdom books, as with uh, Job and uh, Ecclesiastes or Kohelet. All of them want to say, attain wisdom through a wide variety of life's experiences. And then there are also a number of Psalms in the book of Psalms 
that commend wisdom very highly, like Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the whole Psalter, and it's all dedicated to wisdom, and Psalm 1 and a few other psalms are wisdom psalms. Plus, when you look at the historical narratives of the Bible, you see a number of people like Solomon are portrayed with demonstrating wisdom. Uh, Sometimes the prophets, especially Amos, uh, demonstrates the use of wisdom, even wisdom forms of speech. Wisdom is, in in Hebrew, chokhmah, is a feminine noun because in Semitic languages like Hebrew, all abstract nouns are feminine. So they portray wisdom as a lady. They personify it as a woman, a beautiful woman. But they also um, personify folly, that is, you know, being a fool as a woman, because folly is also a feminine abstract noun. And this is a way to portray wisdom as very attractive and folly as unattractive. And Lady Wisdom addresses the students in the book of Proverbs in particular and invites them to forsake folly Give up being a fool and follow wisdom. This is a good thing. Stop being a simpleton and stop being a fool. These are very good admonitions. And you see various promises are laid out. Now, something about the wisdom that is set forth in the book of Proverbs and some of the instructions. If you look at the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs, it's not Proverbs that you see there. The little instructions to to the students, exhorting them to be wise and not to be foolish or immoral. And immorality is folly. What the wisdom books try to do is show that if you do immoral actions, that which goes against God's commandment, you will suffer the consequences because breaking the commandments makes you stupid. That's all there is to it. And this is something that um, ask most of the people who go to prison, most of them will tell you they were dumb and they got caught eventually. Not the first time they did something wrong, but eventually. Now, in the Proverbs, they are very short two-line statements, and that's a different kind of speech. They don't tell you what to do. They just say, this is the way life is, and they put it in very succinct forms. In Hebrew, oftentimes, it's just six or seven words, maybe eight sometimes, usually six or seven and they can just be very, very short. The topics that the books of wisdom cover apply to all areas of life. Respect for your parents, training your children well, how to deal with wealth, how to deal with political power. It's not that they're against wealth or power, but don't be a fool when it comes to wealth and political power. There's a lot about hard work and as well as honesty in business. Also, the relationships between husbands and wives is a very important part uh, of dealing with it. And these are just among some of the issues that are laziness is is a, a great, great thing that they deal with. And when you get to some books, the book of Sirach is a bit later. It was written around 196 B.C. And in Sirach, they treat those same topics, but also in a new way, they treat friendship. It's got some of the best passages 
on how to be a good friend and what to expect from friendship. It also, Sirach also has a section on the wisdom of the various professions you find in life, including the only treatment in the Old Testament on being a medical doctor. So you have a lot of things like that. And when you see a proverb, you see again that it just makes a statement. Like in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 2, it makes a statement. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. It's not telling you to do anything, is it? It's stating a principle of life that if you get rich by being a wicked person, it will ultimately consume you. It'll destroy you. It won't profit ultimately. You may think it will, but it undoes you. Ask some of the drug lords who have become multi-billionaires, but then end up in prison. You know, this is the way that it goes. This is what Scripture is saying. It won't profit. But if you do that which is righteous, it'll deliver you from death. Now, sometimes being righteous gets you into trouble. Lots of people get uh, canceled on the Internet because they say morally good and true things. That happens. But ultimately, by maintaining that righteousness, you eventually will get through it. And even if you are martyred, your martyrdom gives you eternal life. And uh, usually the people who martyr you are the ones forgotten, and the martyrs are the ones remembered by humans, but most importantly, remembered by God. And this is something that when we take a look at these Proverbs, we have to then ask ourselves, um, you know, what do I do? How do I best respond with wisdom to these various statements? And that means you have to think about them. You have to reflect on the experience of people around you. I wrote a book that uh, on uh, the book of Proverbs and everyday living, you know, that you can get also from EWTN.com. Uh, Just going through these Proverbs and seeing some of the wisdom and reflecting on what that means. And this use of human thinking, human reason, and observation of experience is how you can gain insight through the Proverbs. Um, this idea that you can use your mind to gain wisdom permeates all the wisdom literature. But you need to think and reflect. This is a good thing, and the Bible is not against uh, thinking. It wants us to think. But Here's another aspect that we also see in the wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, there's a very important verse. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So this fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Is it the ultimate end? No. Ultimately, it's love. But fear is the beginning of wisdom. And this uh, principle is stated elsewhere in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. You see it also in uh, Psalm 111, verse uh, 10. And Job 28, verse 28. And in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. And many times in the book of Sirach, this is a commonly stated principle. Wisdom begins with fear of the Lord. What is that talking about? It is helping us understand that wisdom begins with faith. Whether you're 
whether you are using faith in science, which is an act of faith, or you are using faith in God, another act of faith. Hopefully the two go together, but you want to have a commitment to faith as the start of wisdom. And then your mind can build upon your act of faith. Now we're going to take a break and we'll come back and talk more about what does that mean to say that you start with faith, but then you build on faith to gain wisdom. So please stay with us. We'll be right back. We are discussing how we need to use human thought, reason, and thinking. This is biblical. There are books dedicated to wisdom, that are, wisdom that is acquired by thinking and reflection. And it's very important. That's what we talked about. Fear, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Wisdom, though, as important as, as reason is, it must start with faith that God is correct and you build upon that. Um, this is something that goes on with many scholars. I used to hear uh, various people, including some of my teachers, who would claim, well, Bible scholars today no longer think that Jesus actually multiplied loaves and fish or Jesus did not heal. And there, there's a whole, I mentioned last week that there was a whole seminar, the Jesus seminar, that disbelieved most of the gospel based on scholarship. But here's the thing that was important about it. They started off with an act of faith that Jesus cannot do miracles. He does not do miracles today and he cannot do them in the future. And he never really did them in his own time. If he doesn't do them today, he didn't do them back then. That's their act of faith. And once you start with that act of faith that Jesus doesn't do miracles, then you will say, well, therefore, the miracle stories were all made up. They were all lies. And of course, that means the resurrection is false. See, in other words, however you start off your basic act of faith and whatever principles you make an act of faith in, those principles lead you to logical conclusions. You will use your mind to think logically. If you begin, though, with believing in what God has said and accept in faith what he says, then there's another logic that develops because you are using the principles of faith. You're using your reason to base your ideas on faith. I cannot emphasize what a difference it is. These scholars did not prove that Jesus did not rise from the dead, as many of them claimed to do. They started off with a principle from a philosopher named Martin Heidegger, who taught that the authentic faith only comes when you face death. To believe in the resurrection gives you a way out of death. Therefore, faith in the resurrection of Jesus is not authentic faith. Do you see how that starts off with the principle that authentic faith faces death? And if it takes you out of death, it can't be authentic. 
that was his basic act of faith, and that affected all kinds of modern scholars in the 20th century, like Rudolf Bultmann and others, whose books were taught in many, many Protestant seminaries, and some of them were also taught in Catholic seminaries, though the church had prohibited them officially. Many times they were used anyway. And it was a different act of faith, an existentialist act of faith, not a Christian one. So you have a starting point that is an act of faith. Even if you are an atheist, an atheist cannot prove that God exists. The, more they can, the most they can say is that I don't have evidence that God does exist. And they therefore make an act of faith that there is no God. And they think it's a good one, they go from that point forward. So these are acts of faith, one, to not believe in God or to believe in God. And you have to take a look at the act of faith that makes the most sense out of life and, and reflection. And this is uh, your starting point. It's like the, the building... Uh, 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 you're, you're building something on ground. That's why our Lord Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. I know of a case of a house built on sand that fell. The Jesuits had bought an old apartment building and, uh, you know, it was, it had a basement, all this. Nobody realized that it had been built on the original be uh, beach of Lake Michigan. The beach today is a couple blocks to the east. But after the Chicago fire in 1871, they took all the rubble from the city, put it in the lake as landfill, covered it over and made a park. Then they built on the old beach. And we bought a house that was built on that beach. There were some construction guys next door who were pounding a pylon into the soil and the pounding shook the house for a couple of weeks. And then, because they're doing one pile in after another, and finally one day the house collapsed because it was built on sand. That is, oh, by the way, the people who did that just happened to go out of business, went bankrupt, so they didn't pay for the house. Be that as it may. This is a good example of what it is like to build on sand. And when you take a look at some of the acts of faith <clears throat> even made recently in our country, acts of faith apart from God, that if you just take away the police and let people, you know, trust them to be good, let their own innate goodness come out, then they will act better when there are no police to curb them. How's that working out in the cities that defunded the police and reduced the sizes of the police forces? Check into it. Look at the crime rates in those cities and see as an example that it was an act of faith that people would just act better if you took away the police and trusted them. And that act of faith was like that house built on sand. It is collapsing. Whereas 
an act of faith in God also includes an act of faith and a commitment to his commandments. And you build upon the things that he has revealed about himself, including his moral law, and you can build solidly on that. You take a look at the Sermon on the Mount, you can build on that. And this is a very basic principle that the mind has a very important function of building upon your act of faith. You make your act of faith first, and I hope you make it in the good God. But if you do, then you use your mind to build on that using the principles God has revealed. So you start with faith, and you build on it and develop your ability to listen to God better and better. You use various principles. Um, you know, uh, one of them is, uh, this is the most important principle. That's the basis of all logic. It's called the principle of non-contradiction. What does that principle mean? It means that you cannot say this is a computer and at the same time it is not a computer. You're contradicting yourself. You cannot say that I am a man and at the same time say I am not a man. I'm one or the other. You cannot logically contradict yourself. Now, people are rejecting that principle today. That's one of the reasons that you have people who don't like God's commandments until they get robbed. All of a sudden, it's a good idea. But if other people are being robbed, then, you know, it's, it's negotiable. No, you can't contradict yourself. Either thou shalt not steal applies to everyone or it doesn't. You can't contradict yourself. And you use uh, from that first principle develops the rest of your logic. That's what's key here. So you start to use syllogisms. A syllogism is a very simple statement where you say, uh, as an example, all dogs are mammals. Then, as a, a, a minor premise, you can say, well, my pet Fido is a dog. And therefore, you can conclude that my pet Fido is a mammal. If all dogs are mammals and Fido is a dog, then Fido is a mammal. That's a logical conclusion. And, you know, they get more complicated than that. And you have to study logic which, again, pay attention to those people in our schools in particular who are against studying logic. They try to forbid it. They are canceling Aristotle because he wrote the logic, the, the book on the, some of the most basic logical principles. And this is something that is rejected because... They don't want you to think about their principles. They want you to make an act of faith in whatever they say. Even when they contradict themselves, they want you to keep making an act of faith in them, no matter what they say. It becomes, in their minds, a game of Simon Says, and they are Simon. That is not the way you build your faith. You build your faith on God and on fear of the Lord, and fear to displease Him, fear to go against His will. And you begin to build on that and move towards loving God as His will makes more and more sense and His commandments make more and more sense. You move toward a love of God. And this is a, a great gift. It even makes possible arguments because you can base arguments on the same principles of logic. You can have conversation because you agree on first principles 
including the use of reason and thought. This is a great task for us. And if we are going to move forward in listening to God, we have to, again, start off with faith in him, but use the gift of logic that God has given our minds and not the minds of other animals in order to build up what it means to, that we have to do in listening to God. This would be a very important uh, set of tools. Well, well, we'll stop there. Next week, we'll continue uh, discussing those issues. But I want to get to some of your questions and comments. So let's do that now. We'll start off with Judy. Judy, where are you? I'm from Lewisburg, West Virginia. Well, you're something. Good to have you on the, the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. So what's your question? Or, okay, my or question comment? is this. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I do believe in miracles, but this question is sort of through me. Uh, I saw a program uh, saying that the home of the Virgin Mary had been moved to different locations uh, mm -hmm. to protect the home. They said it was carried by angels. Mm -hmm. uh, would you please comment on this, if there's been anything in church literature discussing yeah. this? Yes, I can. As a matter of fact, um, this is something that's been researched. The, the Blessed Mother lived in Nazareth, and the people of Nazareth lived in a number of caves, some of which are natural, some of which they carved a bit more. They would start off with a cave and carve into the limestone, which is relatively soft. And you can, if you go to Nazareth today, you can see a number of those cave homes. They, when they built the new church back in the 1960s, they found so many of Our Lady's neighbors' homes. You can even still see the smoke that, that, that was the carbon from smoke, and there's, there's smokestacks and things, and lots of other items that were in their houses at the time of Christ. Now, in some of these caves, like the one where Our Lady lived, they would also put in front of the cave a part of a house, so that the back of the house was into the cave, but there would be a front because caves oftentimes are wide open. So they would add with stone uh, an extension. And by the way, why did they live in caves so much? Because caves maintain the same temperature, winter and summer. But you can warm them up fairly easy in the winter. So uh, it was a, a good place to have people live and it was safe. Now, it's that front part of the house that was made of stone that was moved. The back of the cave is still in Nazareth. And I've offered mass in it any number of times. So that, the, 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 just the natural rock is there. The front part was moved. Now, who moved it? It came to Italy, and it is presently in the city of Loretto in Italy. That's why you hear about Our Lady of Loretto. Uh, in fact, the uh, Texas city of Laredo is the Spanish spelling of Loretto. So that's where that comes from. Now, who moved it there? Well, it was always said the angels. But in, the, the, in that region, the family who went on crusade was the family, the Angeli. Angeli. Their last name was Angels. And what seems to be the case is that the Angels were the Angeli family who had gone on crusade to the Holy Land, and 
they brought back the house. All the stones, they put them on ships and brought them to Loretta, which is on the Adriatic Sea, and reassembled it. Just the way, if you ever go to New York City and you see the Cloisters Museum, there are a number of monasteries that were taken apart, stone by stone, in Europe, brought to New York and reassembled to form that museum by the Rockefeller family. And that's what the Anjali family did. So it's not the angels that you know, are around the heavenly throne. It was the crusaders of the Anjali family. And there are records of the Anjali family in that area who had gone on the crusades. They were the ones who brought it back. But sometimes in oral tradition, you have to be careful. You don't want to make a miracle out of something that is normal experience, but you do want to understand uh, what happened, and that seems to be the case there, okay? All right, let's take a break, and we'll be back with more of your comments and questions, so please stay with us. Right, just want to mention that tomorrow, January 26th, Wednesday, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, on EW10, I will be talking with Notre Dame law professor and a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, O. Carter Sneed. And we will talk about human embryo research, about bioethics, what it really means to be human. Uh, and this is a very important issue because it has had a big impact on the way the vaccines for COVID were developed uh, in some cases. So, and how they were tested in other cases. So what are the ethical ramifications? It'll be good to have his discussions. And I just want to mention again that today is the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. Uh, it was taken from being a persecutor to being a, uh, an evangelist of the gospel of Christ. And that's a big conversion and it's, I was reflecting this morning as I was uh, preaching over at St. Elias Church that you know, there are about five times that St. Paul or St. Luke describes Paul's conversion. And that brings out how important conversion is. And so it's good for us to reflect on our own experiences of conversion, how we came to either start living the faith or to live it more seriously. So it's a great feast for us. All right, want to uh, go over to um, another email. This one is from Sammy. It says, Dear Father Mitch, a friend of mine recently suffered a miscarriage and a well-intentioned friend said to her that God didn't want that for her. Can it be that God truly doesn't want these sufferings for us, but allows them for our sanctification and those around us? Sammy. Uh, Sammy, um, we have to be very, very careful about how we interpret other people's suffering. It's oftentimes difficult enough for them to understand it. And it is, I come across this a lot, I mean, I've certainly thought about it in my own life. There are a lot of times 
when I think it is a mistake to try and understand the meaning of suffering while it is going on or immediately after a terrible event. Overall, is that, you know, we, we might say, God, why did you let this happen to me? Instead, it's better for us to, under, to take a look at the suffering and you know, seek God in the midst of the suffering. I find usually in the most serious kinds of difficulty and suffering, it is reflection later on that helps us to understand it. And that's a very important thing. And we need to understand it in terms of our relationship with God in light of what he's done in our lives. Oftentimes these stories have to unfold before we can make sense. Give ourselves time before we interpret. Now, in terms of your specific question, it is true. God's perfect will does not want people to suffer. That would be his perfect will. But his permissive will, that is where he allows certain things to happen when you know, the various uh, decisions are made for a variety of reasons uh, that contradict his perfect will. Um, but when we come, th that's a good principle to understand that he really wants everything good, but he also uh, permits evils. And as Archbishop Sheen used to say, that he may have had a certain symphony and sin or some other catastrophe is a sour note in the plan that God had. But as we bring those sour notes to him, our Lord is capable of making new chords, using those sour notes and changing them with a new chord into a new harmony. That takes time. So that would be my recommendation. Let's go over to Susan. Susan, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Evansville, Indiana. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. What can we do for you? I was reading through Genesis again, Father Mitch, and I noticed that God created light, but it doesn't say that God said, let there be darkness. So right. I wondered if darkness was always there or if it was mm -hmm. the result of the creation of light. And in the same way, I noticed that God didn't say, let there be waters. He uh -huh. controls the waters. He yeah. creates heaven and mm -hmm. dry land. And yeah. the waters were used in the flood and the disciples were mm -hmm. afraid of the waters on the boat. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to hear your comments on that. A couple, yeah, a couple of things. Hang on just to make sure uh, we're, we're with you here. Um, you're right, you know, the vacuum of space was without light. There, there was no light in the vacuum of space before the Big Bang theory, before the Big Bang. And the whole premise of that primary explosion, which was, according to this, our physicists, it was an explosion of pure light. The whole universe was in a compact ball about the size, somewhere between a baseball and a softball. That's all the bigger it was, but it was just pure light. And then within seconds, there was light everywhere and all the building blocks of the universe were present. It's an amazing thing uh, that the Big Bang is a very important principle. And so there was only darkness before that and then there was light. But there, it also says that there's light and darkness. Now you're right, he doesn't create the waters. and this sense of water is, uh, you know, I see this in one of my favorite uh, Arabic hymns that it, it says, 
Uh, it, it's a Good Friday hymn. It says, today was hung upon a tree, the one who hung the universe in space. But the word that's used for space is the word meaning, uh, a word meaning water, mai. So that uh, God had hung the world in the universe, into space. And this idea of the water is the ancient folks understanding of what we call outer space. They didn't have a word that would mean something like vacuum. There's no word for that. They had not experienced, you know, a vacuum. It's maybe some relative ones, but, but no real vacuum. And they had no idea that outer space is a relative vacuum. It's not a pure vacuum by any means, but it's a relative vacuum. And this, they thought of it as being more like water. That's why it's not said to be created. It is this pre-existing uh, uh, vacuum where there's nothingness, but it's able to sustain the universe. That's what they seem to mean by water. And I still see it in this very wonderful, um, uh, uh, this hymn, Alium uh, Olika. Uh, you, you can look it up uh, if you're ever interested by uh, Fairuz, d- does my favorite version of it. Um, and it helps me to understand that kind of uh, concept. Okay. All right, now let us go to an email from Jack. Hello, Father Mitch, with all due respect, how can you call the Catholic Church apostolic when in the inspired word, the apostles never mention any of your Maryisms like baptism of infants? And no, and never one example in the book of Acts of confirmation. Well, actually, Jack, uh, confirmation, the term, the Latin word is not used. Uh, But what you do have in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, when the deacon, Philip, baptizes the people of Samaria, he is not empowered to confer the Holy Spirit upon them. He must call the apostles, Peter and John, and they come and lay hands, which is the action of of confirmation, and uh, and they receive the Holy Spirit. So there's a good example of receiving baptism first, and then sometime later confirmation. And so so it is an Acts of the Apostles, and then um, I don't know why you call baptism of infants a Maryism. Uh, it's just baptism of infants. A good example of that would be in Acts chapter 19 when we have this uh, baptism of the jailer's household. And the word used for household is the word that meant the parents and the children, oikia, not oikos, which would be the uh, owner of the house and the slaves. So infant baptism was practiced and there were some old women in the 140s who were baptized by the apostles as infants 70 years earlier. The Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And we appreciate all the support you can give us by keeping us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill so we can pay our bills too. Thank you and God bless. (music) 